When you talk about animation, there are only a few films or TV productions that are considered masterpieces. Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, the first animated feature film, is one of them. Many would call the first computer-generated feature, Toy Story, one as well. Films like the 1990s Disney Renaissance era, like Beauty and the Beast or Aladdin, count. Most of Hayao Miyazaki's filmography is up there. And of course, there's the greatest animated TV show of all time, One Punch Man. But there's one title that most people only know in passing. As a Japanese anime film, this movie did not get a major release in America and was a strange science fiction film that most audiences missed out on. It has since grown a cult following among animation and sci-fi fans as perhaps the greatest work of animation of all time. As someone who works in animation, when I first saw this film, the first thing I wanted to do was take a deep dive into the final animation and pick apart what made this work such a transcendent technical achievement. Akira, or Akida, was released in 1988, directed by Katsuhiro Otomo, who also wrote the manga the film was based on. This video essay will not focus on Akira's story at all. I want to focus on the work of Otomo, chief animator Takashi Nakamura, animation directors Yoshio Takeuchi and Hiroaki Sato, art director Toshiharu Mizutani, and the animation work from literally dozens of studios. And we're going to focus on a single four minute sequence, the early motorcycle chase that the film is perhaps best known for. This will not be an analysis on story, voice acting, music, or anything like my usual videos. This will be a long form, frame by frame, deep dive into both the technical and creative aspects of Akira's animation and art style. I want to dissect why this film is so well known as a technical animation masterpiece, and I'll try to get into how the animators did their great work along the way. To better review the animation, I will be adding time codes to the top right corner of the frames. That way, you will be able to better see if I'm playing back the picture at speed or slow motion, or even jogging frame to frame. I'll add these back and forth symbols if I'm doing anything complicated in the playback, and I'll add this loop symbol if I'm looping the action. In animation, every time the camera cuts, we count this as a new scene. For the purposes of this video, I'm going to number each scene and start counting from this scene, Kaneda starting his motorcycle, at about 3 minutes, 36 seconds into the film. You don't have to do this to enjoy this video, but I encourage you to watch this sequence from 3 minutes to 7 minutes of the film runtime, just to get a feel for how the director and editor paced this sequence out and edited it together as a whole. I put links to find the film online in the video description. All set? Let's get into it. Okay, scene 1. This is one of our protagonists, the biker gang leader, Kanada, starting his high-tech motorcycle. I like the detail of this lighting effect, a form of rim lighting that's mostly on the character's face. There's also a small animation error at 0302. Kanada's screen left arm coloring changes for a frame to red. This is called a color pop, and this happens all the time in animation, usually a simple error by the colorist or the compositor who assembles the elements of the shot. More on compositing later. The pop happens again at 0310. Scene 2 is another short one, Kanada reversing through this puddle. Nice job of having the puddle and the painted background appear to splash up around the tires as the bike cuts through it. In 2D animation, BGs are normally hand painted and cannot be manipulated in the individual cells of animation. But of course, in this scene, this water should be moving when the bike roars through it. The animators hide this with what's called an effect, which is pretty much any animation that is not a character. This can be smoke, dust, changing lighting, explosions, what have you. The scene is shot from what's called a three-quarter down angle, and is notoriously the most difficult angle to draw, well, anything in. Watch your favorite cartoons and see how few times directors use this angle, or how ugly the characters look when the angle is used. So props to the animators for making this angle look so good with such a complicated, sweeping motion. Scene 3 is another short one, Kanada revving the bike up. To make the motorcycle engine rumble, the animators use a technique called trace back animation. This is when an element has two poses, an A pose and a B pose, and the animators rapidly switch back and forth between these poses to give a simple idling animation. The cycle can have more poses, but the technique is still a rapid animation cycle. Animators will also use this technique to simulate a character struggling, or something like a character shivering in the cold. You can tell it's used here in Akira, because there is also an animation error screen left. A white speck of dust pops on and off on the B pose of the animation cycle. 
Scene four is just a push-in of the motorcycle tire. We have some cool electricity effects with some inner and outer glow effects to make the electricity more interesting. There are some changes on the lighting effects on Kanada's legs. They do not match the electricity effects. They more closely match the revving of the motorcycle. This is a good way to keep the scene alive and a nice little detail. A lot of the stuff I've been talking about here, you never see in TV animation or cheaper animation. Every new drawing is a lot of money that could be saved by just holding a frame still. Most people won't notice, but this animation team is giving it their all and nearly every frame is a new drawing. Scene five shows Kanado revving up and taking off. We're in the same three quarter downshot angle as scene two. So again, it's impressive the scene looks good at all. The only other thing to note here is the lens flare lighting effect on the bike. I like how it twists and changes every frame. These are more details that most animators would skimp on. Scene six follows the headlight of Canada's motorcycle panning across a painted BG. Not much to talk about here, right? That's where you're wrong, mon frere. Remember that the painted BG cannot be manipulated and it's a perfectly flat element. Notice that the spotlight conforms to the indents on the wall. The animator had to carefully draw this spotlight frame by frame to make the background feel like a 3D element. They even drew a moving drop shadow on this board, this telephone wire, and this light pole, all to make the scene feel 3D. Amazing amount of work for a scene that is not even one second long. Scene seven is our first big action scene and our most complicated scene yet. Although as we've learned, every scene is secretly complicated. Let's quickly talk about the two major forms of animation, not 2D and CG, but animating on ones and animating on twos. Animating on ones is animation that has a new drawing every single frame. This results in a smooth, detailed, and articulate look to the animation. It also costs a fortune and takes forever. It needs to be just about perfect to look good. This type of animation is usually only reserved for prestige animation like feature films that have the big budgets to cover all the necessary drawings. Almost all CG animation is on ones since the computer can do more of the animation heavy lifting and it just plain looks weird if CG is not on ones. Animating on twos is where there's a new drawing every two frames. The result is a bit snappier and quicker with more little jumps between poses that is still readable to the audience. It's also literally half as much work and half as much money as animating on ones. So this is usually used on TV shows and other small budget projects. Akira is primarily animated on ones for that smooth and articulate motion. But look at this scene. Notice how all three of the motorcycles are pausing in between different frames. This is a beautiful combination of animating on ones and twos to create an exciting shot full of energy and motion. The motorcycle speeds can be adjusted from slow to fast by changing them from ones to twos throughout the scene. Every frame is a moving image, even if not every character is actually moving. This is just brilliant problem solving by the animation team, and this is the shot that made me want to do this video all together. Really excellent work here. Scenes 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 are excellent examples of a multi-plane camera move, or parallax. This is where a background is broken up into several individual elements and moved across the scene at different rates of speed to give the illusion of depth in a scene. You've probably seen examples of Walt Disney's patented machine the company built specifically for camera moves like this, so it's not like this technique is new or anything. I really like the parallax of the buildings here in scene 8, and it gives the surrounding city a very densely packed sort of feeling. However, the streetlights in the foreground look a little stroby here because they are animating on twos while the rest of the BG is moving on ones. Not so bad you notice though. Scene 9 is a different take on the parallax effect, a little cleaner since the motion of the buildings are all going the same way. Very nice skyscraper paintings from the BG team. However, scene 10 is pretty rough in my opinion. The three separate layers of the BG feel very flat and cut out to me. This is because the building paintings are drawn at different angles like they're on a curve, but are panning straight right to left. Not really a big deal though, and the laser beams and spotlights in between the BG layers distract from the strange motion. Scene 11 is a very clean example of parallax, with lots of beautiful animation here in the foreground. Parallax works best when it's very simple, like in this scene. I love the lighting effects and glows on all of these flashing neon lights and there's a nice transparency effect on this woman walking. Nice compositing work here to put all these complicated elements together in a realistic way. Well, as realistic as a futuristic super city can be. 
Scene 12 is another simple parallax effect. Nice job on rotating this hologram character. Characters rotating is really hard to do and easy to screw up. TV production will try to avoid this as much as possible. There is some dirt on the cell at 2710. Scene 13 is not an example of parallax, just a panning camera shot. I love the detail of the painted BG. You don't even notice how much detail is in this shot until you freeze frame it. The amount of work put into these scenes that are only about a second long is phenomenal. Scene 14 is just a weird future street light changing signs. There's a minor compositing error at the top of the scene where the BG moves when it shouldn't. On a non-animation note, how the hell does this stoplight work? Why does future Tokyo not have green lights? Scene 15 is another simple shot of these two cars driving off. I believe there's another compositing error at the top here where the car's headlights flicker on. But hey, maybe in the future your headlights turn off at stoplights. I don't know. Scene 16 has a great lighting effect of the incoming motorcycle headlights creating this long cast ground shadow on the car. The animators even drew the shadows on these little pebbles in the street. If this was a TV production, someone would get promoted to king of animation for putting all this detail into a scene. Adding the rocks makes the camera move more interesting because we see more things panning in the BG and moving backwards in perspective. The animators could have very easily just removed the rocks and not worry about anchoring the rocks to the moving BG or adding the long cast shadows, but they did, and this scene looks fantastic. Another detail that almost everyone watching will never notice, but took a lot of hard work to accomplish. Don't worry animators, I see you. Scene 17 is a static shot of these bad guy bikers going around the yellow car. I like the detail of the bikers' shadows appearing in the car's headlights, but I also notice there are matte lines where the car headlights and biker headlights intersect. Another minor error in compositing, and not a big deal. This is called a cheat. When something is technically an error, when you take a magnifying glass to the scene, but works fine when you play the animation at speed. Perfectly acceptable in motion, which is all the audience ever cares about. Scene 18 starts with this cool light effect coming through the driver's side window, implying another bike is coming right at the car. Very cool effect and attention to detail as the rays of light animate through the scene, although the rim light on the car seat fades on about three frames too early. I like the effect on the windshield smash. The black and white flashes simulate a big energetic crash. This is another animation cheat that works well. The flash of energy of the attack on the car wouldn't look right without any sort of effect. So good call by the animators to add in the graphic effect and cheat the action. Scene 19 is a cool shot of the bikes coming into camera. Characters moving towards camera is another sneakily difficult thing for an animator to do, but this looks nice here. The lens flare effect isn't exactly realistic or anything, but another little effect that reads well at speed. Scene 19 to 20 has what's called a jump cut. This is not an animation term, but rather an editing term where the camera cuts and removes information and action in between shots or scenes. We don't actually see this pipe hit the car, but all the action is properly implied and it plays perfectly fine at speed in our heads. Again, this is a good cheat that probably wouldn't work at all if we saw all the information. It would slow down the action of the scene to get that impact on camera and registered in our heads. This is a great editing trick that nearly every director and editor uses. Nice job at the end of scene on the cracking and falling glass. Scene 21 moves pretty quick. We have a character filling frame with a moving BG. Hard to process, but that's okay, because the audience should be focused on this red bomb coming into camera. The best way to get an audience to see something is not only put it in front of your face, but also obscure the information on the rest of the screen. Scene 22 has a great detail at the top of the scene. Eight frames of the biker's trailing light effects leaving scene, implying continuous motion from the previous scene. Nice touch. Similar to the windshield break in scene 18, this explosion has a black-white flash frame to imply the big explosion in the car. Nice job on the detail of the crumpling car during the explosion, although it feels like the animation goes to slow motion when it shouldn't. Not sure if this is an error in the animation timing or a creative choice by the director. Scene 23 has a pretty slow-looking smoke effect. The smoke isn't really billowing like typical smoke effects, but it still works fine, and I love the coloring. Nice composition at the start of the scene too. I like the low angle camera and the smoke centered on the BG street going off into the distance. There is a color pop in the smoke at 5416. 
The end of the scene has a camera move following this guy, Yamagata, off screen. The directors didn't need to add this camera move at all, and could have saved some money keeping the scene a static shot. But the panning camera following Yamagata is a great editing choice because it makes the next cut to scene 24 easier to read. The audience knows we're following this character now because of that little 20 frame camera move. Great directing choice that pays off in the final cut. Scene 24 is an excellent example of an all-time great animation cheat. Speed lines. Looking at this frame by frame, it's quite obvious the BG is not moving at all, and we've just got some scribbly lines moving in the foreground. Nothing is really moving past the camera at all. But at speed, it looks like we're going 100 miles per hour. A classic and effective cheat. I like that when the pipe sparks on the ground, there's a white lighting flash on the motorcycle as well. It really pluses and sells the effect. Scene 25 is another amazing example of the hard work put into this film. Yamagata is covered with what's called overlapping animation. His hair and clothes getting whipped around by the passing wind is not necessarily hard to do, it just takes a long time and a lot of hard work to get done. But the effect is necessary. Imagine if this guy was cruising along at 100 miles per hour, just frozen like a statue. Like the speed lines, overlapping action is a technique for emphasizing artificial speed and motion. Except where speed lines are pretty simple, overlapping action requires lots and lots of frame by frame animation. Because of the cost, TV animation tries to avoid scenes like this. So next time you see it, take a moment to reflect on the poor animation team that spent many extra late nights getting the shot done. Scene 26 is a pretty simple scene. We have some nice speed lines on the ground, plus a cool parallax effect of the city in the BG. The very slow panning effect of the BG buildings implies that they are extremely large and far away from the camera. But I think the scene goofs up because the bikes turn right with nowhere to go. What exit or intersection are you taking, dude? There's also a layering error at end of scene where the streetlights are layered on top of the characters. Another minor compositing issue. Assuming that the action in scene 27 is continuous from scene 26, we have the wrong street lamps in the BG. This is called a hookup error, and it happens all the time in live action productions as well. This lamp thing is extremely minor, I only noticed because I'm analyzing the sequence. The bad guy's turning animation is on twos, but switches to ones when he straightens out. When the background straightens out, Notice that the BG is painted with streaking lights, implying fast motion. Remember that the painted BG cannot be animated like the characters can, so give credit to the directors and art team for thinking ahead on how to build this shot. In scene 28, the road has changed texture and colors. Another hookup error. This one sticks out to me more because the street coloring fills the frame. At frame 01, 04, 23, there's a bit of a pop in animation. Notice the big jump in the action as I frame back and forth. This is another animation cheat to imply fast motion. If there was a jump like this when the characters are just standing around and gesturing with their arms, we would call that a technical error and ask the animators to smooth it out with what's called an in-between. Animation is made up of two types of drawings, key poses, which are the main beats of a motion, and in-betweens, which are all the frames between each key pose. These in-betweens are where the real interesting animation choices are made. How much information to put into a character's action between the key poses. I won't dive too deep into this now, but getting back to Akira, the missing in-betweens works because we're going for a fast, violent motion here. At 01, 05, 08, there's another color pop on the bike, and at 01, 06, 00, there's a full color change on the bike with a bunch of dust shooting out the bike now. I think this is a full-on error here, but again, not a big deal. Scene 29 is a pretty big BG cheat. Weren't we just in a big, dense city? Now it's all pitch black back there? I think this is too big of a cheat, personally. The directors don't really get away with this one. Nice animation on this guy falling over, but I don't love the slow motion. Nice touch with the speed limit numbers flying through frame. They are readable at this angle, implying the bikers were going the wrong way down the street. Scene 30 just shows two baddies cruising, setting up that we're in a different location. Not much to see here, except that these guys way in the background have a tiny little rim light effect. Yet another micro detail that most viewers will never ever see. I love this BG painting too, very detailed, and I like the mixture of Japanese and English lettering. Scene 31 is a complicated shot that has a few issues, but I still like it a lot. I love the setup of this shot, that we're in a restaurant looking out. Just a strong director choice to shoot from here 
to keep things interesting. The motorcycle action in the BG is clear and easy to read, even at high speeds. I love the little reflections of not just the restaurant patrons, but also the surrounding tables in the other windows. At 01, 10, 11, I think this guy's turning head pops too much and needs an in-between, and it's not really a big deal. There's also a significant pop in all of the props and shadows of the scene at 01, 11, 05. A prop is anything that is hand-drawn but is not a character. For instance, the curtains, hanging plants, seats, and the stuff on the table here. These are usually hand-drawn because the animator is going to animate them at some point in the scene. If the element is not going to move, it is usually painted into the BG as a static element to save some drawing. At 01, 15, 08, when the next motorcycle's headlights point right at the couple, the light overtakes their reflection for a few frames. Nice detail, although I would have simplified this a little myself, since it looks like the reflections pop off and it kind of reads like an error. At 01, 16, 01, there's another significant pop as the motorcycle comes through the window. This is to simulate the sharp reactions from the couple, so that's okay. But the props in the BG again pop badly, like a new artist is drawing them. Notice that the crash is on twos, making the action snappy, but a little poppy and jumpy. It works at speed. Scene 32 is a cool shot, but unfortunately has some major problems. At frame 01, 16, 21, the biker pops off entirely. At 01, 17, 23, the curtain is mislayered in front of the table, and at 01, 18, 01, the curtains and one of the hanging plants pop off entirely. Pops like this happen frequently in animation, even in modern digital animation, but I'm surprised that these goofs weren't caught by some quality control person. Scene 33 is another simple scene of Kai coming into camera. I like the framing through the broken window and the touch of smoke at the bottom of frame. If I were directing though, I would have removed the camera move at the head of the scene. Don't really need it here. Scene 34 is an equally simple scene. Nothing to report here. Scene 35 is a cool shot of three bikes coming into camera. Note the changing lighting effects on both the painted BG and the props screen right. The rest of the action is a little poppy when you look at it frame by frame, but it works in motion, implying a very high speed through the alley. The only error here is that the lighting effects stay on after the bikes pass by and the dark lighting doesn't return, but who's going to notice that? Great overlapping action in scene 36. I love how the banana and newspaper slowly flies off this guy's body as the scene progresses. Easy to miss considering how fast the scene is playing. Scene 37 also has excellent overlapping action, just less banana peel. Scene 38 is a cool shot with a cool BG painting. Notice the exaggerated perspective on both sides of the alley, leading the eye down to the street. Nice touch with Tetsuo's shadow in the headlights. Scene 39 is super fast, but notice again the spotlight effects conforming to the fake shape of the painted BG, applying 3D depth to a flat element. I'm not sure if scene 40 was a nightmare to animate or a joy, because the chaos of the debris is just wild. Some animators might think this would be a lot of fun to just draw crazy stuff. Other animators would probably hate to keep track of each flying piece of trash. Either way, the scene is expertly done. Bravo on the hard work on, again, a very short scene. Scene 41 is another solid action shot. I love the sweeping action of the motorcycles going first right to left, then cutting back left to right. We have more of this slow motion smoke in the background. I guess this is just how the art team wanted to do their smoke and dust for the movie. Another fantastic BG painting here too. Scene 42 is one of the most thoughtful scenes of the sequence. The animators and timers took great care in slowing down their animation to make Tetsuo struggle with the bike, implying the bike is super heavy. You really don't see much of this in animation nowadays. Even for a really heavy object, animators and directors will add like one pose of the character struggling, and then they lift up the object like it's no problem. But I was really sold on the weight of the bike here. Another instance of the team going the extra mile. Scene 43 is a cool angle to shoot from, an ultra low upshot, but it looks like we're missing the background entirely. What happened to the surrounding buildings? Scene 44 has our slow motion smoke and dust again, but this time it dissipates off pretty quickly. Another great BG painting, showcasing the small, run-down side of town, contrasting against the huge city further in the background. Scene 45 is a jump to some sort of highway, and we're back to the speed lines, implying a fast, 
cruising speed. The panning lane divider lines are a nice touch too, again showing fast movement. Not much else to report here besides some slight overlapping animation on the first two bikers' coats, and some traceback rumbling animation on the mufflers of the third bike. Scene 46 is, in my opinion, an ugly ass shot. The parallax is moving oddly, the layers are cut out poorly and moving in weird directions, and too fast. The lamps in the BG take over the shot. All this bright white light crowds all the action. And I don't get the impression the bikes are moving fast enough here. The speed lines aren't matching up for me. If it were up to me, I would have removed them entirely in this scene. Scene 47 has more background parallax effects that I think is a little too much and overemphasized. Nice articulation on the purple biker falling over, but it again feels like it's in slow motion. Scene 48 is a much better, simpler parallax BG effect, although we lost the street lights. Hookup error. The scene looks better without them though. Frame 015813 is our Akira explosion effect again, a full white card simulating the initial explosion of the bike. I like that the animators chose to not add a rim light or silhouette effect to the foreground biker, as one might expect. Scene 49 has more parallax than you can't even really see because there's so much going on in the foreground of the scene, but that's okay. I think the motorcycle explosion and debris should be falling away faster into the BG. Right now, it looks like either the bike is still moving super fast along with the other bikers, or the bikers aren't moving very fast at all. I guess this is just another dramatic effect of how the animators want to portray the sense of speed in the film. Scene 50 has a more simplified overlapping action, but it still looks good. Notice that the bikers move straight left to right across camera. This saves the animators the difficult job of redrawing the characters coming closer to camera. Good choice to save a little money. Scene 51 is another pretty big cheat. Instead of a painted BG, we have these speed lines in the sky. We call these ziplers, zip pans, blur pan BGs. They have lots of names, and they're a quick way to fake a moving BG without painting a massive asset that moves with the camera. The animation on this bad guy is pretty weak. He might as well just be static. But note the slight trace back on his body and overlapping animation on the gloves. 52 is a simple reverse shot of 51. And now we're at the bad guy biker's point of view. Another blur pan BG, this time though, with no overlapping animation on the character's clothes. Notice this big pop in scene 53, again implying the very fast motion of the swinging pipe. This works, but it's so fast that you don't really notice that this outstretched nail is actually cutting the biker. Nice detail, but really hard to read. This scene should have had what we call an impact pose. This is a type of key pose that specifically details the action of an impact, and it's super important that the audience gets at least one clean frame of the contact during any impact action. Otherwise, it's not clear that there's any impact or collision at all. Scene 28 had this crucial impact pose, and the action was stronger for it. 54 has another missing BG, replaced with the blur pan. Again, works fine in the moment. The overlapping action on this character returns. Most importantly though, I love this edit here. The editor uses the white flash, showing impact, to also cut to the next scene and show us the rest of the action from a better angle. This is the inventive editing I love to see in live action films, and it's very cool to catch something like that here too. Scene 55 starts with this impact BG color card that fades off. Don't think you really need that. The white flash at the scene cut worked fine, but this is cool too. The pipe guy again falls in slow motion while the BG whizzes by, so something feels off here, but the animation is solid. In 56, these stupid lamps are back with no city BG, but I think the shot works. Nice touch on the bike going over this poor dude's arm. Scene 57 is, in my opinion, a bad cut, and the next few shots are rough. This shot is Canada coming the opposite way down the highway, towards the bad guy biker, and coming from the city. But because the backgrounds from the last few scenes have been the blur pans, it's hard to tell which direction we're now going and who we're looking at in this scene. When I first watched the sequence, I thought this guy was just the obscured bad guy biker. Scene 58 is the baddie reacting to the incoming Canada. Again, I don't feel like that's super clear from the sequence of shots, but it makes sense with the next shot, scene 59. A nice reveal of Canada. No city in the BG, and I'm wondering why they avoided it this time, because I think it would have been a cool shot with the city buildings back there, framing Canada. 
Scene 60 is the bad guy smirking. Okay, hold on. 61 is the baddie lining up the center line across from Canada, setting up a head-on-head -head game of chicken. The speed lines look good, implying some form of motion, but there's nothing panning backwards in the BG to actually show us which way the bike is going. It doesn't matter too much, since our brain pretty quickly puts together the bike is coming straight towards camera. But I think those passing lines with the brakes in them, or rocks in the road, would have been a good idea here. Scene 62 is Canada matching the bad biker smirk from scene 60. I like the direction here, signaling that the two are ready to duel. More great overlapping animation here, but not too much else going on. Scene 63 is a nice multiplane in the background that makes it feel like we're going really fast. However, the composition kinda sucks. The frame is filled by this biker who I didn't even know has been riding with the bad guy. And then the bad guy biker himself is barely in frame, only visible for the last few frames of the scene. This scene got botched, in my opinion, and could have been cut out entirely. Scene 64 highlights Kanada's high-tech bike, with electric sparks and all, and it contrasts nicely with scene 65, the bad guy's bike, which is like an old-school lowrider. Scene 66 is a little weird. Not only do we have that brown biker from scene 63 that was missing for most of the sequence, but we now have purple biker swinging in. They are also stopping with this weird long skid that doesn't match how slow the BG is panning. Something's just off here. Scene 67 is just a cut-in of those two bikers. Nice smoke effect coming through, but 66 and 67 could have been cut out entirely. 68 and 69 are basically sister shots of 64 and 65, where again contrasting the bad guy's more low-tech bike with Canada's super bike. Only this time, it's a more complicated action shot, with both characters coming right at each other, on the brink of a head-on collision. Nice stuff from the director, but no background again. I guess you could say here that the director only wants us to focus on the bikers, and that they have tunnel vision, looking only straight ahead at the battle before them. I don't know, I probably would have gone for a BG here. Scene 70 is a close-up of the baddie biker sweating profusely. Pretty ugly drawings here, if you ask me, but the cut-in emphasizes the climax of the sequence. Same with scene 71, only now we're pushing in on Canada, and we get a really good look at this overlapping animation on his jacket and hair. A much better shot than scene 70, in this humble critic's opinion. Scene 72 has no BG. Bummer. Anyway, the two bikes meet here, and you can see that as they cross paths, both bikes are dropped down to about 50% opacity. This is a very clever trick to help the audience register what's going on. If Canada's bike was at full opacity, we would just be seeing his bike roll through frame with no idea that the bad guy's bike crossed him. If just Canada's bike was transparent, we'd barely see him and only register the bad guy coming through. So to solve the issue, the animators DX both, and the audience just gets a hint of each bike passing through. Just enough information for the audience's subconscious to piece together what has happened. This is a great trick that is pretty much impossible to pull off in live action, unless both bikes were computer generated. This is one example of the fantastic things you can do in animation if you're a good storyteller, director, and problem solver. Scene 73 is a shot of the bad guy ditching his bike. I say ditching because he looks like he's perfectly fine at the top of the shot. It's not like Kanada knocked him off balance or anything. There's not even any wobble on the bike like the bad guy got hit. He just ditches it, as far as I can tell. Nice falling animation, but if you hit the ground while going 150 kilometers per hour on a bike, you're gonna roll, not freeze and slide. Scene 74 is not only one of the most famous shots in Akira, but one of the most famous shots in animation. And not because it's difficult to animate or anything, just because it kicks ass. No analysis needed here, friendo. Scene 75 is a slow-mo scene of the baddie reeling from the ditched bike. Kind of weird that the BG has already stopped moving, implying the bike and rider were at pretty slow speeds. They were going way too fast for them to be stopped perfectly like this so soon. Doesn't read great to me, but it's fine. Scene 76 is a close-up of the baddie at a tough angle to draw, and, well, I don't think he looks great, but at least the scene is short. In scene 77, Canada looks up, not much to say. Scene 78 is the longest shot of the sequence, showing these cops riding up to the scene of the battle. My only comment is that, like similar shots in this sequence, it's difficult drawing a character or object coming into camera, especially if that object has rigid structure like a car. There's not a lot of leeway when drawing this scene. An animator can't fake it by drawing in-betweens rough and loose, 
and letting the timing and key posing play quickly so you don't notice. The human eye can spot an error if it's drawn poorly, but I think this looks pretty good. 79 is a close-up of two bikes racing up. We've got our speed lines, plus some passing pebbles to help us see the direction of the action. 80 is a nice action shot of Tetsuo and Yamagata meeting with Kanada. I think these two skids look really good, much better than some of the skidding and stopping action earlier in the sequence. I also like when Yamagata starts turning his bike, his headlight starts lighting up Tetsuo. Nice touch. The shadow on Yamagata's bike does pop off at 030015 though. Scene 80 cuts nicely with scene 81. Tetsuo and Yamagata are doing what we call settling, which is just an emphasized ending movement of a character's action. This is one key to what one might call good animation. If there's no settle and a character just stops moving after an action, it feels like there's no momentum or weight to the character, and all the action preceding the settle feels fake. Articulation like settles or antics are crucial for living animation. The editor then does a great job cutting right on this action to tie the continuous action together across scenes. Scene 82 is a strangely long scene of Kanada turning around. Why he takes so long to turn, I'm not sure. It's not like all these drawings are bad or anything, it's just not how humans turn around. I like the composition of the scene though. Scene 83 is much like scene 42, where the biker struggles with the weight of the bike, getting the thing upright again. Nice work. But then something weird happens at 03, 06, 16, when the motorcycle headlight fills screen. This is supposed to simulate how light would actually hit a camera lens and balloon up for a frame if the light is pointed straight at camera. But since it's literally for just one frame, it reads like an error to me, what we call a flash frame in animation. Similar to the quick lighting changes in scene 31, I think this would have played better without the little detail. The end of scene 83 has our two mystery bikers I keep forgetting about joining our lead baddie, and we have the patented Akira slow motion smoke. Scene 84 is a cool shot of Kanada peeling out close up to camera, and I think these smoke effects look great. However, the smoke is gone in 85, another hookup issue. There's also a color pop on this wheel at 03, 13, 16. Cool, dramatic lighting effects behind the bikes as they ride away, and a pan up through a beautiful background. And we're out. So what do we learn from this four minute sequence? Well, first off, every shot is densely packed with information and detail, much more than you can even register with your eyes on a single viewing. Second, the animation team deserves some sort of medal for all of the overlooked hard work they did here. There were a ton of details in their animation that are not only super hard to notice, but took forever to get done. Things like the changing light effects on the background, redrawing spotlights on flat elements to look 3D, super detailed layering on short scenes to make the composition feel dense, BG paintings with amazing details only used for a single scene, shadows on pebbles for god's sakes. I don't think even top tier Disney animators would do some of this stuff. It's a shame, the animators excellent work is mostly unsung, because I think some of the stuff is literally too small and too quick to catch. But whether you register all the painstaking hard work taken to make the sequence special or not, the overall effect still makes a strong impact on the viewer. Just looking at it one time through at speed, the sequence is exhilarating and breathtaking, and it sets the tone for the rest of the film as an animation masterpiece. Looking at the credits, I count 64 key animators across two animation studios, about 100 in-betweeners, 15 animation checkers, and 28 partner studios. This is like a Marvel movie. And that's just for the animation departments. There were also about 100 inkers, painters, and art designers to make this project come to life. It takes an enormous amount of people and hard work to make an animated film. And you can double or triple that number for a film as well crafted as Akira. If you haven't watched Akira all the way through yet, I invite you to do so. Akira is a crown jewel of all animation and remains a gold standard for meticulous hard work and out of this world artistic talent. 